Hello again, guys. Welcome back. This is Comic Kid here again, and today, uh, today we will be discussing some of the good things to come out of Amazing Spider-Man 2. Now, it was recently confirmed not terribly long ago that Jamie Foxx will be returning as Electro in the upcoming uh, Spider-Man 3 movie with Tom Holland. Now, we aren't quite sure just yet just how big of a role Jamie Foxx will play in the movie, but we do at least know that he will be back as Electro, and his Electro will not be blue. Now, this has also led to a lot of speculation that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield will also be returning as Spider-Man for, like, a Spider-Verse type movie. Unfortunately, at the moment, those are just rumors. Uh, there was a source that confirmed it, but then Sony themselves came out and said that it, they aren't in the movie yet, and so details on them two are still out, but... That doesn't change the fact that Amazing Spider-Man 2 was still very divisive, and also the reason that Sony decided to partner up with Disney with Spider-Man in the first place. Now, Spider-Man 2 was far from a box office like bomb and failure. It actually did pretty well, and it wasn't completely panned by critics or fans. But, you know, it's also not the most celebrated superhero movie of all time, or even Spider-Man movie. Some people even say that it's worse than Spider-Man 3, but that's just kind of up to the individual. So I guess that's actually our first note about this movie, was that it didn't do well enough for Sony to continue with their own plans for Spider-Man, and we got Tom Holland's Spider-Man in the MCU, which a lot of people seem to prefer to what path they were on. Now, the film is often criticized for having, like, too much kind of crammed into one movie, and it definitely could have benefited from, like, a much longer runtime if they wanted to go that route, but at the same time, the film does kind of prove that a Spider-Man solo universe could work. They tease characters like Black Cat, you have Alistair Smythe in this movie, you have everything kind of revolving around Oscorp, and I think making everything revolve around Oscorp is a pretty solid way to kind of tie everything in the Spider-Man universe together. Uh, the movie also puts heavy emphasis on Peter's parents, and in the comics, whenever they come back, uh, it's eventually revealed that they're androids that were designed and built by Harry Osborn and Screen Goblin. I'm not quite sure they were going to take the same route. There is a deleted scene where Richard Parker comes back and is talking to Peter, and I'm kind of glad they decided to cut that because that would have definitely been, like, too much for the film. But with how many, like, kind of plot points and other characters that they tease and set up in this movie alone, you can definitely see that, yeah, the Spider-Man solo universe probably could have worked on its own. And then, of course, one of the other major positives in this movie is the cast. Now, whether or not Andrew Garfield is your favorite Spider-Man or not doesn't change the fact that, you know, he still fits the Spider-Man role pretty well. He's got good comedic timing. He's wonderfully awkward as Peter Parker. If anything, the dude's a little too cool to be Peter Parker, but, you know, like, Garfield did a great job with the script he was given. Uh, Emma Stone is back as Gwen Stacy, and it's really hard to dislike Emma Stone in any role, and again, she just really kind of hammers it home as Gwen Stacy. Obviously, Jamie Foxx as Electro is a major plus. Jamie Foxx is a phenomenal actor. It just was kind of an unfortunate script, and, you know, like with Andrew Garfield, he did the best with what he had. Now, with all that in mind, I actually think Dane DeHaan as Harry Osborn was a great choice for Harry. He looked very modern, very updated. You would totally believe this guy was some spoiled rich kid who was sent off to boarding school, and I thought how they played with him and like brought him back into Peter's life was great. What they did with him when he becomes Green Goblin is a different story, but as Harry Osborn, you know, I thought Dane DeHaan did a perfectly fine job. 
And then, of course, you have Sally Field returning as Aunt May. She does a, a decent job, you know. Aunt May keeps getting younger and younger as the years go by. But, you know, I thought Sally Field did a, a really nice job. She's not in the movie a whole lot, but she is still a welcome addition to the movie and still made for a great Aunt May, in my opinion. And then one of the more interesting things that I noticed was B.J. Novak as Alistair Smythe. And never in my life, and I actually didn't catch this the first time I saw the movie when I was doing the rewatch for the sake of this video, I happened to notice. And I don't, I, I just can't imagine seeing B.J. Novak acting threatening in any way, but I didn't hate the idea. Who knows if they were actually going to go anywhere with it, but you know, it's still a nice little setup that they had, so... Now, to keep going with some of the more mechanical aspects that the film gets right is the soundtrack. Now, Hans Zimmer came in to do the second one after the tragic passing of James Horner, who scored the first Amazing Spider-Man movie. Uh, Horner died in a plane crash, and so Zimmer was brought in to do the second film, and it's really hard to go wrong when you have Hans Zimmer scoring your movie. The music throughout the film just fits really well. Uh, it's not Zimmer's greatest work in my opinion, but it certainly fits the rest of the movie, and you know, each character has their own theme of course, and so if, you know, Zimmer is obviously gonna do a great job, but where he really excels is in like the Spider-Man theme with just those three notes with the bum bum bum. That's the heavy use of brass instruments there. It's just really hard to dislike at least the Spider-Man theme song in this film, in my opinion. I, it's absolutely phenomenal. And then lastly, Spider-Man's costume. The first film was kind of criticized for taking a significant departure with Spider-Man's look. Uh, I believe Mark Webb himself said that he uh, told the costume designer to do something entirely different but still familiar. And based on that description, I thought the suit in the first film turned out very nicely, but the suit in Amazing Spider-Man 2 is arguably the most comic accurate Spider-Man suit on film to date. You have the big eyes, uh, the black webbing, uh, it does resemble Maguire's suit very closely, uh, but the black webbing and the big eyes are a big distinction, and just something about it, it it's just, it, it was pulled straight from the comics, and there's no denying that this suit is one of the biggest mechanical positives that this movie has. That said, obviously some of the other costumes in regards to like the villains do leave a lot to be desired. But Peter's suit, Andrew Garfield's suit, the Spider-Man suit itself is nearly perfect. Really the only thing that could have made it more comic accurate is a round spider on the back rather than just the standard one that is closely resembling the one on the front. But that is everything as far as the mechanical aspects of the film go, so now we're going to look at some of the things that like the story itself gets right. And one of the more immediate things that I notice is that Spider-Man in this film is actually inspiring others. He's very involved in New York City. Uh, when he first takes down Electro, you even like notice him calling some of the firefighters by name. And just seeing this interaction between Spider-Man and New York is really well done and refreshing. We're kind of so used to seeing him get beat down and whatnot that, you know, it's just... It really gets the sense that Spider-Man is more of an everyman's hero. And it does it a lot better than Spider-Man 3, where you know they're throwing him a whole parade and you have what's effectively Spider-Man Day and stuff like that. No one's doing that in here, but they know he's there to help. It's not that surprising if you see Spider-Man and you're just like, hey, Spider-Man. And so seeing Peter interact with New York and its citizens in such a way that he actually inspires them in the process was very well done throughout this entire movie, I thought. And then I did kind of mention this earlier, but the Peter and Harry dynamic that's portrayed in the film just also works really well. When you have Maguire and Franco doing it in the first one, you get the sense that they, like, were 
friends and still knew each other. In this, you actually see them hanging out with each other. They're telling jokes. They're giving each other a hard time. They feel a lot more like natural friends, you know, at, at first, obviously. And I feel like had the film ended better, what they established between the two in the first half really could have made the ending a lot more like emotionally impactful had they executed the ending much better. But there's no denying that these two actually look and feel like they're friends in this movie. And while we're on the subject of relationships, Peter and Gwen themselves are a major plus throughout this movie. Uh, I believe Garfield and Emma Stone were actually uh, dating each other at this time. I know they're not together anymore, and I believe they broke up shortly after filming wrapped on ASM2. I could be wrong on that, but you know, they really feel like a couple. You can tell they are just in love with each other, then despite the rough patches in their relationship, you know, you kind of got this with Peter and Gwen in the comics as well. They had their ups and downs but at the end of the day, they could always rely on one another to be there. And while they could have probably tweaked some of the dialogue between the two and not had them go on such a typical breakup and get back together storyline, the actual dynamic between them is portrayed very accurately within the comics and very realistically as well, in my opinion. Furthermore, uh, you actually get a mention of the Ravencroft Institute, which uh, as many comic book readers know, is a massive, it's effectively Arkham Asylum in the Marvel Universe. And you could tell that they would have definitely gone back to that had they continued with their Spider-Man universe. And so it was really kind of cool to see, like, a setup for an entire Spider-Man rogues gallery. Obviously, we know they wanted to set up the Sinister Six, but Ravencroft really kind of foreshadows plenty more Spider-Man villains to come. And so it is a little disappointing that nothing more is going to come from that, but that's besides the point. And then for as weak as Harry's motivations were by the end of the film, when he's actually like going crazy, it really makes sense for him to kind of devolve as a character and become the villain uh, based on how he's set up in the first one. You know, we were told up front that his father is dead and that he is also dying, and so he's desperate to just survive. And based on that, I obviously think it makes sense that he would become the villain of the story at some point. I just think they could have executed it a little better, spent some more time with the character to really show how he devolves and goes insane and etc etc but i was at least happy that he wasn't so like oh i hate you spider-man for very little reason or that it wasn't just some um, i want to blow up the world for almost no reason type of plot harry actually has his reasons for hating spider-man in this movie aside from just oh i don't like him and of course we have to talk about what is arguably the best scene in both Amazing Spider-Man movies, and that is the final scene of Amazing Spider-Man 2. Uh, Mark Webb does a great job of bringing everything full circle, and you see one of the kids that Peter you know, rescues kind of early on in the film in a Spider-Man suit, and he's doing what Peter told him to do. He's standing up against the bullies, He's trying his hardest to make a difference however he can and however he knows how. And obviously he's some kid going up against some insane Russian version of Paul Giamatti in a mechanical rhino suit. But it shows that Spider-Man is making a difference in this universe. It shows that he's having an impact on those around him and that he is a great character. And this is something that is absolutely wonderfully conveyed in the final scene alone. And then, of course, seeing Peter himself actually come back and everyone be like, yeah, Spider-Man's back. It's like, how do you not get at least a little, like, just pumped or excited or even teary-eyed at that moment? And then, of course, you end on the insanely cool, like, rhino fight where he's swinging everything around. And even though you don't see him actually beat the rhino, you, you know he does because he's the hero. He's the good guy. That's what he does. And he's back. 
And so for all the other faults that this movie has and all the other trip-ups and mistakes that it does make, it undeniably ends on an incredibly high note. And that final scene is truly something for Mark Webb and his team to be proud of. But that is about everything I have for you guys today. Again, I'm in no way trying to justify this as like the best movie ever made. Don't get me wrong, it's also not the worst superhero movie ever made in my opinion, but, you know, it does kind of make sense that it ended the franchise right there. And so, would I have been happy to see more? Of course, but am I at all upset that we're not getting more? Also, not really. But that is everything I have for you guys today. Let me know what y'all thought of Amazing Spider-Man 2 down in the comments section below, and let me know what other types of movies you guys want me to talk about in some later videos. But thank you guys for watching, be sure to hit like and subscribe, and I will see you guys again real soon.